Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Streaming Alchemy. I'm John Mahoney, and on today's show, we're going to be taking a look at a studio build we just did for a friend that we think you might find some interesting bits in. Uh, it covered a lot of different areas, so we'll dive into all of this in a moment. Uh, but to start, I again want to welcome everybody to if you have any thoughts, any questions, uh, any suggestions, feedback, please just put them in the comments below. Uh, we'll address everything we can right here on air. Uh, also, if you would like to join us live on the show, please just uh, click on the link below. And, uh, you know, it's, it's in the show notes, so you should be able to connect. And somebody from the studio will get you on air with us. So thank you. And thank you, everybody, for your patience. I know we did not have a show last week, and that was because we were down in Florida building a new studio for a friend of ours. And there were a lot of interesting parts to getting the studio build together. Uh, and it, hel it helped us think through the process for analyzing what needs to get done and then building a plan around executing on that. And it also taught us you know, some of the things that uh, you forget when you don't do these types of things in the field as often, where you have to have more flexibility around certain things. And you know, things don't always go uh, the way you plan, but there's always a plan to deal with it. And that's, that's probably the best way to look at it. So let's actually get started. Uh, we did the studio build in Florida, and it was for a production studio that will basically mirror a radio station where there'll be multiple guests, but all of this will be with video. So it'll be basically the visual radio metaphor that we were looking to capture here. And as we started this, there were a set of design criteria that we really uh, ran with. So let me go through that here. So the requirements we had were first that this studio was going to be operated by an on-air host. So it had to have everything accessible and really uncluttered in the design for how we would interface with, how the host would interface with the studio. Uh, the second thing because this was going to be designed around more of a talk radio style, where there'd be a lot of interaction between people, there had to be clean lines of sight between everybody. Everybody had to be able to make easy eye contact, and there couldn't be a lot of gear in the way. And that was also necessary for line of sight with cameras. Because this was going to be visual radio, we needed to have cameras that could capture people from multiple angles, and that required a very sort of low footprint, low height level design for the studio. Uh, as I mentioned, it was going to be around a radio, which would be more talk format. And there were a couple of things. First, there could be multiple guests in the studio. Uh, so that could be from one to three guests. There could also be from one or two hosts. So in total, four people in the studio at a time but the mix of uh, who's hosting and who's guesting could vary. So we needed to make sure we could easily support that. The other thing is this was going to be a multi-camera shoot. So we have four cameras in the studio. Two of them are PTZ cameras, and two more are fixed lens cameras. So we would have a variety of shots we could take, capturing host, capturing the guest. And so we had to design for that. We had video calling, so they use live to air, and they're going to have up to two of the four available live to air guests could join people in the studio. So again, keeping that same model where you could have a mix of guests and host. Uh, this will also give us remote guests as well. The other thing which was also very important to them is that they have a phone call-in system they use. So if people wanted to call in via phone, they had the ability to do that as well. This would be streamed to social media, so Facebook, possibly LinkedIn, YouTube, the usual suspects for social streaming. Uh, it would also be recorded locally. But one of the other requirements was that in the future, they may want to do 
syndication. And that would require another outbound process for encoding and distribution. So we had to leave that possibility open in the design. So, so let's, uh, let's basically go through the main components in this. But actually, before we start, let me just check on people that have signed in. So we have uh, Hakan from Sweden. Great to have you here, Hakan. Uh, Sisse, hello. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate that. We also have David from Costa Rica. David, thank you for taking the time to join us here. Uh, we have Joey from the UK. Joey, thank you for stopping in. And we have Mady. Uh, so thank you. It's always good to see you. Oh, and, and Christian. Christian, hello. Thank you for joining us. So let's jump in and take a look at the, the main components that uh, we'll be using here. So I really split them into two groups. The first would be the two main components we use to process video. And that would be a NewTek TriCaster Mini. So this is the first generation, so it has you know, some limitations compared to later versions, but still a, a very powerful switcher for all the video processing. And the second is they're using a live to air system to bring in remote guests. So these are the two main video source components in addition to cameras that will be coming into the studio. And from the audio side, this was interesting. They have, I mentioned they have a phone system. And so that's something that they will be using to bring in callers, and that audio will be coming in via Dante. Uh, the, they also using a radio station style mixer. And this has a two components, a, a control surface which sits on the desk, and a rack mount component which actually handles all the I.O. connections and does the serious processing that goes on behind all of this. So that's the AEQ capital IP. And we'll talk about that a bit more. But in this setup, we're going to be having video coming in through SDI and NDI. And we're going to have audio being routed around via Dante and through analog connections. So let's jump into how these hookups would actually work. So if we look at the TriCaster, for the TriCaster, I mentioned we had four cameras. So they were Blackmagic design. They have a, a, a mini cinema camera and an Ursa Mini. So those are the two. They're coming in via SDI. And to connect to the TriCaster, they're using an SDI to HDMI converter because the TriCaster Mini here is an HDMI model. So we bring those in. We have two PTZ cameras that are coming in. And those are both coming in through full bandwidth NDI. We also have two, up to two remote guests coming in from the four channel live to air system they have, and those will also be coming in full bandwidth NDI. Uh, and finally, we have an input of audio coming in from the capital IP mixer. That's the uh, radio mixer we talked about. And that's coming in via Dante. So the model that's being used here. Uh, so we're clear is that all audio is routed into the capital IP mixer. And from there, any source that needs audio, the mix is created there and distributed to those devices. So that's the model we're using in setting this up. And then for outputs, we are sending uh, three output feeds. One is an audio feed out from the TriCaster, which will have anything that could be playing on a DDR. And the reason we're doing that is so that if you have somebody on live to air or somebody calling in by phone, they would be able to hear that audio uh, from any media that could be played there. The other thing that we have is we have the, a return video that's going to live to air because those guests will need to see video coming back to them that are remotely based. And we also have a program feed video that would be going to whatever system is going to be used for encoding. And I mentioned that we need some flexibility there based on how they want to do distribution. So right now, this is set up so we have an NDI program feed that we'll use for encoding. So 
The next piece uh, is live tear itself. Live tear itself is, is fairly straightforward. We have uh, two inputs. One is the video return coming back from the TriCaster, and the second is the audio return for our remote guest, which is coming from the capital IP. And the audio return is only a single feed because live to air will do the mix minus for the individual guest. So all we need is a studio feed with none of the live to air guest audio in it, and the rest of that chain will work itself out. And then we have four outputs. The first is we have NDI video coming out for guest one and guest two, if there were two guests. And we have Dante audio coming out that's routed to the capital IP uh, for guest one and for guest two. So again, everything in and out of live to air is going over IP. So the capital IP uh, is really the heart of all the audio processing we have going on. And in that, we have four microphones, because we mentioned there's going to be up to four people, different combinations of guests and hosts, uh, that will be coming in. And those are all coming in over standard microphones, XLR, uh, analog signals. And so we have those four inputs. We have the phone system they have, which will be outputting Dante. Uh, and that will come in as another mix. We'll have the two Dante audios for the live to air guests one and two that could be remote video guests. Uh, we also have outputs from the capital IP, one for live to air. We have another for the phone system, another for the TriCaster, and another for the encoder. So the model you're going to see when the TriCaster is configured is that we'll have all these video sources coming in but there will really be only one audio source that will be coming in to the system. And all of that will be controlled through the capital IP control surface. So it simplifies access for a single host. They don't have to look at the TriCaster screen to do level adjustments for anything. That will all be done by a physical control surface. So the phone system is actually it's a, a Mac Mini runs a, a small piece of software that talks to a cloud-based phone system. And that basically has uh, Dante in and Dante out. Uh, Dante in is the return audio those phone callers will hear, and Dante out goes into the mix for the rest of the studio. So in total, we have five full bandwidth NDI sources we're going to be dealing with here, and seven Dante audio sources. So it's actually a, a fairly small production model that we have to deal with with the IP signal flow. So pretty straightforward for that. And then the two physical camera inputs that we'll also be using. So now let's talk about the physical layout, because this was the other piece. When we started this, and this was sort of our initial uh, design, we didn't have a third guest or second host position sitting over here. Uh, and we really had two guests sitting over here and a host here with what we envisioned would be sort of a pedestal with microphones coming out from it. So that was the original design. And we had more monitors that we were envisioning having on the desk. But after we sort of refined the requirements where we needed this extra host slash guest, we decided to open this piece of the desk to allow a third person outside of the host to be in the studio. And we really planned things now around line of sight. So we wanted to be sure that all of the microphones, because we have multiple microphones here, so all of them needed to be low to the desk because the traditional sort of microphone boom comes up and goes down and sort of will block you because it has that arm coming in front or make it very awkward because you're trying to swing it all the time. So these. Uh, microphone stands we used were very low profile, and the microphone would just come up f off of the desk, so a swinging arm with a microphone stand coming up. So that allowed us to maintain those lines of sight, even though we now had four guests. And it required some changes. We had to move how we did the microphone attachments, but it certainly made, uh, you know, allowed us to keep this design. We, we were able to keep most of it and adapt it to 
the physical requirements once we got to the location. You'll also see that we have camera placements now. So we have a PTZ camera mounted on the rear wall, which can cover video for these two guests here. And we have a camera on the front facing wall, which can actually do sort of profile shots or sort of over the shoulder shots between guests and hosts. It can do full host shots for either of these hosts or if this is a third guest, it can do shots of that third guest. We also have the two fixed lens cameras. So one of them is actually under a monitor that's mounted along this wall. And that will be able to capture the host with a, a full on shot. And that can be very useful if the host wants to do something where it's sort of a direct talk to the audience. So it will give them that sort of easy stare in the lens type of shot. And we also have a larger shot, which will be wider angle, which will capture more of the studio uh, and provide a high quality uh, sort of establishing shot that can then be switched out for, for more close-up shots. So that's the, the basic camera design. We have light poles that we put on the sidewalls, and we'll get into what we did there as well. Uh, and we also had to deal with a door that would swing here. So we needed to make sure that all of the wiring and walk paths were all uh, you know, safe and clear, because this would be outside people coming in. So this needed to be something that people would not uh, have to worry about tripping or having things fall on them. So a lot of the design around this was making sure that all those things were correctly covered. So let's talk a little bit about how this all started. When we got there, uh, the first thing we had to do was go to Lowe's and <laughs> get some supplies. So we had uh, the, date, the model for that desk that we were setting up is that there were going to be four 12 view racks, and then we were going to put a butcher block tabletop on top of those racks to form the surface of the desk. And so that is exactly what we did. We, we built four of these racks. And if you notice, it may be a little hard to see, but right here along the top, there are screw holes that allow us to go up and fasten the top. And we use those with lag bolts to attach the top to these racks. But the when the top was assembled, uh, we actually ended up overlapping. The, we have multiple surfaces that we needed to connect here. So this front surface overlaps this rack by about six inches. And so we can bolt it in to this rack as well. And then this long rack actually comes down and covers the rest. The, this long tabletop covers the rest of that rack. Uh, so that means we have solid anchors on all of the boards that we have here. And uh, then we also, in addition to just screwing them to the racks, we use stainless steel plates that had uh, recessed screws. And we put four of those joining these two uh, pieces of uh, butcher block here. So the desk, even though it's composed of individual racks and individual butcher block tops, this piece now functions as a single solid desk. And the advantage we have, if you notice, is that there are wheels on these racks. So not only did this create a solid desk surface, but it's also movable. You can wheel this thing around, which is a big asset, especially for a desk this size, if you needed to get behind it and do anything or access wiring from a different angle this would let you do that. So that was really important to us. The other thing, if you'll notice, is we originally, in our design, had this desk be more of a U uh, with a sort of cutoff on that second return. And then what we, in talking uh, with my friend there, we decided that it would be more flexible and more useful to simply make this a standalone top that could be used for multiple purposes. So if they needed to set something up for a production purpose, if they needed to squeeze in another guest and give them a surface to work on, if somebody just needed a laptop and had a clean place to put it, it could work all those roles and, <coughs> excuse me, and move around from there. So this, again, made it a little more flexible and something we learned once we got there and started to, to play with the space. So let me see who else has come in. 
So, uh, Ang Hai, I hope I'm saying your name right. Thank you for joining us from Vietnam. That is great. Uh, uh, Brulafu, <laughs> I'm sorry if I am butchering your name. Thank you for joining us from Scotland. Uh, so we also have Richard. Richard, thank you. That's uh, coming from Northern California, uh, as he puts, smoky Northern California. Uh, we also have Ryan. Ryan, hello. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us, Ryan. Uh, it's always great to see you. Hope all's going well with you. I know you've got a lot going on on your plate. So with the desk built, uh, there were a few things. One of them is we thought that the tops would have been finished when we got there, but they were not. So we ended up using lacquer instead of polyurethane. Normally, if you do a top, you'd use polyurethane because it's slightly harder uh, as a surface. But lacquer also does the job, and it dries in a quarter of the time. So we were able to do multiple coats. Oh, I, just before I get on, Stephen Haywood. So uh, he just had to make sure that uh, he was here before the party started. So Stephen, thank you. So that was, you know, a few little things. And these are sort of, we had one plan and brought some things with us, but uh, we ended up picking this up and adapting as, as we went along there. So with the desk built, the first thing we did is we started to mark the desk with painter's tape to figure out where equipment could lay out. And we did this really because what you do in a diagram uh, and sort of scale out in a, in a 2D space, when you actually get to a live location, it can actually be very different. And when we tested with our initial design for where things would be, uh, the lines of sight were really not great, and the camera angles ended up looking bad because we, you had a lot of gear that was showing on the desktop. So we actually used it. From this, we actually revised how we decided to, to do the desktop. And you know, we then, you know, from here, we could actually start to lay out the equipment in the final places that we wanted it uh, without risking any damage. Because this here, I mean, one of the things with painter's tape is that you don't have to worry if there's dust in the air or if you, you know, have other tools around. You, you're not putting any equipment in jeopardy. So this gave us that ability to sort of mark it out generally. But once we were pretty sure we had things laid out the way we want it, we actually set things up on the desk and started to get a better sense for the physical space regarding you know, arm reach and everything else. So we were able to do things like install the mic arms, which you can see here are the low profile ones I was describing. And so we have the four of them there. And once this equipment was set up, then we could install the gear and start to do the, the wiring because we knew now distances and what equipment would be in what locations. So we were going to install equipment for this now in three racks. So we sort of numbered them. The rack in the rear would be rack one, which is this rack over here. I'm sorry if the ordering is a little weird. Uh, rack two, which I'll get to uh, a, in, a, in a moment, is really the rack that's in flux. It's where the networking gear is and where we've positioned the TriCaster. And that's going to be revised because right now it has a single internet in infrastructure that services both the house and the studio. And this will be converted to a studio dedicated internet. And at that point, we will sort of look at redoing that rack and shelve and final wiring for that. But that's where all the gear go, all the networking equipment goes, and the TriCaster. And then we also have sort of to the right of the host is the audio rack. So this is where all of the audio inputs and signal processing will be taking place. And right above that on the desk, uh, you can see where this monitor is just in there. Uh, that's where the phone call and system is. So again, that's another piece of audio gear that we kept all concentrated in the one location. So when we set these up, the rack that was in the rear will have live to air and will have whatever encoders we can use. So in this case, there were two encoders that were already available. One was a Wirecast gear, uh, which will probably be the main encoder uh, for the studio. 
that will take the NDI feed and the Dante feed coming in and do the encoding and streaming from there. Uh, there is also a Wowser, uh, you know, Clearcaster. This is a, a slightly older system. I believe this one is only configured to work with uh, Facebook at the time, and that would, you know, certainly simplify uh, streaming to there. But if we're streaming to multiple locations, either that would need to be upgraded to the later models of Clearcaster for uh, multiple social streaming, or we would just stick with the Wirecast gear. And as I mentioned, there may be other equipment for syndication that will need to go in. So that would be potentially other uh, gear that we have to mount in there. And we also have a live to air system. This was not a uh, rack mount system when it was uh, installed. So we, we worked with the unit that we had there. It, uh, it will do the foregas, but this again uh, is just sitting sort of in a shelf position as part of the feed. So this was the gear that we had. So we had three racks that we needed to route all the cabling from, and that would go up to the control equipment that was on the top. So Stephen just made a point. He said uh, he should just get a Behringer uh, X32 and get rid of all the, the rack audio gear. Uh, I think with all of these things, a lot of this comes down to what people are comfortable with. And uh, my friend Jeff actually works at a radio station, and this is the type of gear that he is used to using. So I think if somebody is going to be the on-air host and has developed sort of a rhythm and muscle memory, that probably can work really well for them. Though I do understand if, if I were doing this as a general install, uh, where that sort of familiarity wasn't a requirement, I would definitely look at something like the, the Behringers or the Yamahas, uh, all of which can support Dante, can support uh, analog inputs, and you know are incredibly flexible with the number of uh, mixes and submixes that they can do. So, but I think there's there's probably as much operator familiarity as as a technical reason for choosing the solution. Uh, the capital IP as a solution here. So, so, yeah, uh, Ryan, <laughs> Ryan just mentioned that they're going to have to pry that legacy gear out of their cold dead hands. Yeah, it, uh, it, it's true. I mean, I think once people get used to certain gear, you, uh, it is as much a natural part of how you produce as the conversation and the content you're generating. So, I, I definitely understand it there. So. Anyway, uh, let's, let's move on. So after we rack mounted all the gear and sort of laid out all the equipment on the uh, desktop, we actually installed the cameras. And so we had uh, two uh, Bird Dog P100s here. And so we wall mounted them and you know, ran everything up through cable channels that go up the wall that can be painted when he's ready to go live. And so that gave us you know, the two main PTZ cameras we wanted. And then we ran the cabling for everything else. So even though you don't see it over here, there is a SDI cable that's sort of sitting right by the side of the desk. And that's power cable for the Ursa mini camera. And then we also have for the uh, cinema camera, we have a SDI and the power connections there. And there was not a wall mount. So this is some of the stuff that when we came up, we that was a extra that was, was added. So we didn't have any wall mounts for that, but that's something that we're, we're putting a list together and that will get installed uh, in our absence to get that put together. So this is basically now all the main gear located where it needs to be. And so the one thing then, since we're really at the heart of all this, is the network setup. So I know there were a lot of questions about network and we ended up doing a few things that probably, if this were a larger studio, we, we, we clearly would have taken a different direction. Uh, and also, if we were using different gear. Uh, so long story short, everything, both Dante and NDI, are running on a single switch. And uh, I'm not talking through multiple VLANs. They're all in a single subnet. And the two reasons really driving that were uh, first, 
the number of sources we had was, was really very small, and we had tested performance with all that, and it, it looked fine. And the second was that a lot of the gear that we were connecting uh, only have a single NIC installed. So anything else that we'd have to do would then require some sort of USB dongle coming off with Ethernet, which we haven't found to be incredibly reliable. So when we set the studio up, we did this with the understanding that we'd only have one switch available to us. It's a managed PoE switch, so it could power the cameras. Uh, and we were able to set up any of the core configurations we wanted. And it really was a sort of a compromise of, of sorts for how to do the networking here. But we also figured if we needed to upgrade things in the future, adding a second switch for that uh, and treating them Dante and NDI as two separate networks would not really be an issue for us. So it was something we felt wasn't a commitment. It simply was expeditious for us to do this. But I still want it to go over some of the things that you should keep in mind when setting up a network for both NDI and for Dante. So the, the, the one big conflict in these is that NDI likes uh, quality of service disabled, and Dante likes it enabled with specific values. And that's a difference in the nature for how they each work. Uh, so I'll get into those as I go through this. But basically, things in common, you want to turn off anything with energy efficiency, uh, and that is not a, uh, you know, if you were dealing in a non-video, non-production network, I could see using that, but all of the energy efficient things could uh, power down ports on the network, and that can cause havoc with any of the signaling that goes through. Uh, you, for NDI, you would normally disable quality of service, disable jumble frames, and then everything else you're doing is really uh, around, well, there's enable flow control. But the other piece is that uh, if you're using multicast or UDP, uh, we use UDP, and that's how we, 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 we like to set things up typically. But if you were using multicast, you would need to enable uh, IGMP snooping uh, and you know, change certain uh, settings for that. And you know, this would be something that would allow you to uh, you know, optimize sending a single NDI feed to multiple sources. Uh, the other is you'd want to block any of that traffic from going out to Wi-Fi because that could saturate any sort of Wi-Fi you'd have set up. And of course, the last thing is you need to ensure that MDNS, which is sort of key to discovery, is enabled. Now, there are, you could potentially use Access Manager and other things, but I think that as a baseline setup for NDI, this would probably be a good start point. Uh, on the Dante side, uh, even though the bandwidth is low for what's required for the audio, uh, Ordinate still specifies that you use a gigabit speed switch, and that's that's definitely you know something that uh, I would recommend wholeheartedly. Uh, there are sets of quality of service that need to be enabled, and a lot of that has to do with the way uh, Dante uses precision time code to keep everything synchronized, and you want to make sure that if nothing interrupts the time synchronization, because that's where you get that garble and crackle and other things that happen. Uh, so they have a set of uh, setting, a, a set of uh, parameters that you should set around uh, quality of service. And you also want to you know, disable energy efficiency, again, for the same reasons. It just uh, it can lead to issues. And uh, you would have IGMP snooping enabled uh, for any type of multicast, which Dante certainly supports. So these would be, you know, you can start to see that there are, you know, some things that could conflict with the two, but given the scale of the network that we're using uh, and the, the limited number of sources, this actually worked and simplified the setup for us. So let's see. So uh, give me back to 
the comments. So Ryan just mentioned that he can't wait for you to play with the Netgear 4250. Uh, for those that don't know, the Netgear 4250 is a, a new series that Netgear has come out with higher end gear that is pre-configured uh, to be optimized for things like NDI. And they have sort of standardized configurations in there. Uh, so we are definitely interested. It is a it's fairly expensive, so it's not a th it's not a throwaway. Let's get this and play with it. So we'll need to do a bit more research, but that is is definitely a switch that you know people should take a look at. And and Mady just also mentioned that he's using the uh, TME Digiface Dante for Dante connectivity, which is rock solid. Yeah, in the systems we set up, we are using Dante Virtual Sound Card, but I agree. Uh, we actually love the, the Digiface. We have clients that are using it with live to air. And it is, uh, as many points out, it is just a rock solid piece of gear. We've had nothing but great feedback from that. So thanks for sharing that. OK, so uh, next thing after we have sort of the networking set up is the wiring. And there's a lot of wiring. We spent a lot of time on our backs <laughs> going through the underside of the desk to get everything uh, hooked together. And uh, so we wanted to share a few things. Uh, we don't have to go through. The wiring itself is not particularly interesting. But the way we did it, there's a, a few points that I want to make. The first is that in each of the racks, what we do is we dedicate specific channels, sort of these riser channels in the rack for specific classes of wiring. And normally, we will use the front for all electrical wiring. And we'll use the left rear for analog audio runs and the right rear for digital audio runs. And this stops uh, any type of interference going across the wires. So. I mean, the physics of sort of an electrical signal in a wire, it basically creates an electrical field around the wire as that signal travels. And if you have other wires that are next to it, uh, they, that can induce that signal in them. So you can get different types of crackle, hum, noise that are induced from one wire to another. And that's especially true with electrical, which are higher voltage uh, wires. So these are definitely wires you want to keep isolated from everything else. Uh, the audio runs, the analog audio runs, because, I mean, let's face it, today almost all of what we do is digital. But the analog audio runs, uh, those we keep in a separate channel. They are balanced, so they are less likely to pick up, uh, you know, to have the indu any induced interference uh, be noticed because in a balanced scheme, it tries to take any induced noise out of the lines. And we've covered that in, in a past show around audio. But so we are less worried about that, but we still keep them cleanly away from the electrical. And uh, the network digital runs, that will be, you know, you don't think of it, but SDI and HDMI are also digital signals. So uh, all of those, as well as all of the, the network-based IP protocols uh, and standard uh, internet connectivity, that all runs in those other channel, in that other channel. So they all can stay separate. The other thing is, if you do need, for some reason, to move them close to each other or have them cross each other, you want to do that where they come uh, perpendicular to each other. So that minimizes the chance of induction uh, and induced signal. So that will give you probably the cleanest way to do it if you reach a situation where there's just no other way to route the wiring. So the other thing in, in this is labeling. And uh, we've installed systems, our, our systems, uh, for clients in multiple sites. And one of the things that we find incredibly valuable is having a labeling scheme that you have that's consistent and that exists at both ends of the wire. So our typical model highlights four key things about each side of a connection. So you want to know on the from side what rack is the device in, what device is it, what type of connection is this, and if it's appropriate, what port this connector plugs into. And you also, 
on that same side of the cable have the two. Where is this wire going? And so it'll have those same four elements in it. And this means that no matter which side of a wire you're on, you'll know where it should be plugged into, and you'll know uh, where it is going. And we all know that wiring mysteriously gets unplugged, misplugged, uh, or broken and needs to be replaced. And having that labeling on both sides with both the from and to destinations labeled will save you a lot of headache. Uh, and even things where you would think the port doesn't matter, like in a network switch. Being able to say, can you look at port four on the network and tell me if I'm getting signal there, can make, a, make it so much easier to diagnose an issue if you're trying to, to track a, a problem in a system. So these types of things will save you time, save you headache, and is really just sort of pre-planning for production. You just you know things will go bad at some point, and you want to have the best possible opportunity to be able to repair it in a live environment. So that was uh, you know, the second thing to keep in mind when you do all the wiring. So the other thing uh, which we don't often think about is the lighting side of this. So in doing this, we didn't really know exactly what the room was going to look like and what type of lighting it would need. So uh, we did have a general sense of dimensions. And uh, in the old studio, there were the Manfrotto auto poles, which are those expandable poles that have a tension lock, which go between ceiling and floor. So we, we had two of those there from the old studio, as well as a couple of light panels. And so we decided that we would leverage that. In addition, there were four recessed ceiling lights, and the bulbs in those lights were replaced with uh, high CRI daylight bulbs. So all of the lighting matches and is high quality. So the ceiling light now can provide a full sort of general ambient light level. Uh, and it's on a, it's on a dimmer, so it, it's able to, to adapt to level. And then we have these two side panel lights that we put in. And these lights will let you cover almost like a key and fill where you can cover the guest and the host on one side uh, and sort of the fill on the other side for the uh, other, you know, the other side of the guest and, you know, potentially, you know, sort of a rim light for the secondary host and sort of a side light. So it sort of gives you a bit of a, a uh, fill light, bit of a rim light. Uh, we also, behind the desk, have, it's hard to see, but we have another rear light that would be backlighting for the host that's sitting in the chair. So that will provide, again, a little more separation from the background. But when we set this up, uh, one of the things we were really concerned about was uh, having heavy things high up on poles. Uh, so in this install, we bolted everything with the lighting into joists in the walls. So we used uh, an eye bolt, screwed that into a joist, and then we used uh, twist wire cabling with uh, locking anchors and handled that on both sides of the light uh, bar here. And that means that if the light itself falls or if the, uh, the pole somehow is kicked or slipped, it'll maintain uh, rigidity against the wall so it won't be able to fall and hit anybody. And I think that's something we don't always think about in our studio settings, but safety really is important. Uh, and the other piece here is that this is the pressure release for the, the tension release for the pole. So we strap that as well to make sure that, you know, because let's face it, when people are bored in the studio, they play with stuff. So we wanted to make sure this was clearly not something people would be attracted to play with. Uh, and, you know, this is, again, just something that uh, uh, we did as a belt and suspenders because we, you know, we, we didn't feel this was going to fall. We felt everything was well installed, but we just wanted to make sure that we were covered in case of any accident. So uh, the other piece then is this is the final studio. 
So we, the parts that you don't see here are the, there will be a pole with a second, with the, the uh, Ursa Mini camera sitting over here. That will be a wide angle shot capturing the bulk of the studio. And you, you, the other will be the camera that will be installed in the, in the front, which we, we didn't cover. Uh, we weren't able to install because it wasn't a mount. So, but this is, you know, a very low profile, great uh, line of sight for everybody that's going to be sitting here. And very easy access for all of the devices. So there are, there's the main audio board. We have the TriCaster Mini control surface. And so for Jeff, when he's sitting there, uh, he is able just to, to, to use his single arm, reach in, and he can make adjustments or switch position, uh, switch inputs on the TriCaster without really having to do a, a lot of looking and, and hunting for anything because it, it would be all comfortably within reach. Uh, the other thing is uh, we removed any sort of monitor over here. And this is something where when we mentioned we wanted to have the TriCaster. So that was now set up as a monitor that sits in front. And because this will also have control and multi-view, this will give you sort of the best of both worlds. You can sit back, see everything in the studio, uh, easy access to controls, and just a, a look straight up will give you a line of sight to what's going on in the TriCaster. Uh, and this gives you a, a better sense also of the sort of line of sights. If this were three guests here, you can see it's very easy easily conversational. Everybody can see everybody else, and the gear isn't distracting or in the way. So this is a better view of what Jeff has available to him in, you know, in terms of right in front of him for the studio. You'll also see there is a small, uh, I think it's a, one of the Akai, I'm, I'm not sure exactly which one it was, uh, the mini touch surfaces. So that gives him macro triggering. So something else that's there that will probably, when he's working, will go right, right in front space there in the desk. And in fact, will limit most of what he'd have to do with, with reaching out to the, the TriCaster control surface totally, because it will mostly be macro driven there. So wanted to give you a closer view of the capital IP control surface. Uh, and there's a point I'm going to just highlight here. This, unfortunately, when we did the studio setup, uh, there was uh, an issue with e either the firmware or something in the uh, control surface itself, which uh, made it basically switch off. Uh, and so we couldn't fully configure everything. But one of the great things about this sort of setup here is that not only does it have uh, sort of the physical controls, but it also inside the control unit that's sort of mounted in the rack to the side, it has a whole suite of digital signal processing. So this will allow us to do things like compression expansion, uh, clipping, uh, uh, sort of noise, noise clipping, uh, things that we can, would definitely want in a studio setting. And it is set up very much as a radio station would use it. You can set things up as queued up, ready to go, or turn on basically like a mute and unmute, and you can select uh, any one of the channels that you want active for a particular show. Uh, it has things like automatic uh, talk back to guests. So when you, it's almost like an on-air, off-air for audio, where when you want that guest to hear you, but you don't want uh, the studio to hear you, you can do those types of I'm talking back to those guests. And it's, it's very convenient for that. Again radio centric type functions, but that work perfectly in this type of studio setting. So uh, the interesting thing is once we started to, to, to work with this, uh, it was really impressive enough that <laughs> well, after we had set up all of the gear over here, we realized that some of the things that we have, like the DBXs that are here, uh, which are 286Ss, they're really uh, vocal audio chain processing. So they have uh, like preamps, compressors, uh, noise gates, de-essers, uh, expanders. So it, it really does that whole signal path. It is 
likely, if the audio quality of the digital processing is okay, that everything in this capital IP unit will handle that, and we can reclaim the space or, or put it there as, as a backup for certain situations. The other piece of gear here, which probably is not something most people have seen, is it's the David 4. And now the David 4 is an interesting piece of gear. It, it's, it's really designed to correctly process a audio signal for radio transmission. So this could definitely be important for anything they want to do with syndication. Uh, first, it, it does a lot with vocals. So you, you have things like this, there's some points I wrote down. So it has things with multi-band EQ, uh, special automatic gain control that's much smoother than you'd get you know, from your typical uh, AJ, uh, AGC in a, uh, in, a, in a standard sort of audio box. It has different types of uh, combining, the signal combining for going between mono and stereo uh, because FM radio works certain ways, so it's, it's sort of optimized where if you have mono signals, it can correctly format them to be optimized for FM stereo broadcast. Uh, and it also has you know, more technical things for injecting digital streams like you see in more advanced radios uh, where you'll be able to see names of the songs and you could search for radio stations by genre. It has the ability to embed that in the signal going out. So lots of things, both audio processing and radio specific that may be used in the future. So that isn't something that's directly in the capital IP. So as an external piece of gear, definitely something very cool. And when you hear that, actually the the sound of that, you just get that sort of DJ radio sound that you're, you're used to listening to very easily with that. So uh, a cool piece of equipment on that front as well. So as you mentioned, the, you know, in front is the TriCaster UI, which we think uh, is going to work really well for interacting with everything. And there in the suck corner, you see the, the front uh, PTZ camera that's there. Uh, from the rear, this is a view to live to air. So the, what we saw with live to air is typically, even though you can do calling and there may be a, a need for, for that, like we do here on the show, uh, this will typically be used for uh, pre-planned studio guests. So once they're connected, all the controls really will be right in front of the desk here. So even though this is sort of to the rear, it will work very well in terms of the, the control and flow of the production with that there. So we were, were very happy with you know, that sort of layout. And the fact that monitor now sits in the back against the wall, so it doesn't block any of the flow and it keeps the openness of the studio. Uh, and this is also, you can see, for the, the third guest, this is what we edit there. Uh, this microphone now is, you know, can easily swing out and fill there or it can just push out of the way if there's, there's no second host or third guest. So uh, very, very convenient for that. Also, as a location, this monitor, we didn't anchor it, so if you did want to deal with callers, this whole setup could be used to handle callers coming in and just as a talkback mic. Uh, and because everything is Dante, we have a lot of flexibility for how these routes can be done. So that's just another option for, for working with live to air in the studio uh, and the layout we set up with the desk. So this is the third desk. So we have you know, other mics we were testing with and other cabling. Uh, but really, this is an open rack. And we envision that this will be used dynamically. There'll be a few things that will be installed, maybe shelves in there at some point, And gear will be placed there and taken out. So it was really designed around that. Uh, one of the other things you can see here is at the bottom of all of the racks that we installed here, we have uh, cyber power line conditioners with 15-foot uh, power cables. So we were able basically to daisy chain this to keep a single common ground into a single circuit that was installed to power the studio. So that should minimize hum, ground-induced hum from ground loops. So. Uh, that's just a, another point here. And as you notice, it, 
all everything we did is labeled. So the racks actually are numbered and labeled. So any of the wiring that's there, you'll know what rack by the, you know the number is on the rack itself. So it should be very easy for people to do that. And you also notice we have the light down here that we mentioned before. That's the the backlighting uh, that will get some separation from the wall for the host there. So this is the view that uh, Jeff will have when he's running a show. And you can see everything is really in easy reach. The space in here is, is just like a basically a three and a half foot by three and a half foot square space. So you know there's, there's easy swivel for all of that and, and easy reach. And Jeff is a, a tall guy, so you know, reach is easier for him than for me. So uh, he's like six and a half feet. So definitely uh, you know, no problem uh, reaching all of the gear here. The other thing that I want to point out is that this desktop here is actually pretty deep. This is almost 40 inches deep. And we set this up so that there is almost like a counter that's going across the top, which these guests can all sit at. So they can pull up and pull their seats in and have leg room before any of the racks are interfering with them. So they have, have about 18 inches of depth there for them to feel comfortable. So that was part of the design here is that we didn't just want this to be sort of a solid desk, but we wanted to have that counter edge around it so that it would be easy for people that are sitting there to feel comfortable. Plus, we left a lot of open space under the desk. So if people want to stretch their legs out and do that, they could do that as well. So Hopefully, I think that covers everything we did here in the, in the studio. But uh, happy to take any questions on this. Uh, but hopefully, this gives you an idea uh, of how you could set up a small studio. And I just want to you know, footnote this with that we don't do studio design or construction uh, as a matter of course. This is something that we did primarily for a friend. And we tried to bring what we knew. So if there are any suggestions any of you have around better ways we could have done things, I would absolutely you know, love to have, uh, have that feedback and, and to learn from all of you. Because there's probably people out there that have done much more complex setups uh, than we did here. So, uh, so actually. Uh, why don't we call this a wrap here? We'll go to the after show, and I will uh, take any questions. And there are a few more comments that I want to get to. So uh, let's, uh, let's close out this show. And if you can't stay for the after show, I will see you all next Friday. Apologies for missing last Friday. Uh, and uh, you know, if not, I'll see you in a few seconds. Take care. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the after show here. So uh, thank you for uh, you know, being patient with last week. Uh, we know, you know when, when we were away, we had really hoped we could do a show, but we were trying to get things, uh, uh, get things wrapped up, and we just weren't able to squeeze it in. Uh, but uh, let me get to a few points. So Mady said he, he recommended uh, a patch bay for audio. Uh, so th there's a few things. Th that's a great point. Uh, two things on this. First, anytime you would be dealing with analog audio, uh, I totally would want a patch bay because you can do not just uh, routing, but also some patch bays will allow you to do audio distribution. So you can plug in one device and route it to multiple downstream devices. So that is absolutely great when you can do that. Uh, the other, though, is it can make it easier to do quick fixes. Uh, a, route a microphone to a secondary device, or B, just plug in a second microphone and route it to everything you needed it routed to. So you know those two things are really important. Uh, I think this point also is really one of the strong uh, features of Dante that make it so powerful. Because what you really have in, in Dante is a global patch bay. 
I have inputs, and every one of my Dante inputs can then be picked up by any Dante receiver that is in the studio. So it creates exactly that type of patch bay and makes for very quick routing. So with Dante Controller, you get that in the digital world as well. But that's a, a very important point. That ability to dynamically patch things is critical, especially in a live studio. So let's see, what else do we have? Uh, so Stephen <laughs> Stephen asked uh, when I'm coming to his house. Uh, <laughs> so I know that Stephen has been uh, redoing his studio there as well. Uh, and uh, he, uh, Stephen has, you know, multiple shows. And uh, uh, he is, is, is definitely one of the pioneers in the live streaming space. Uh, so uh, everybody, directly or indirectly, owes Stephen, Stephen a debt of thanks for all the arrows he took in his back for, <laughs> for the lessons that we all can now enjoy as we, uh, you know, as we do our own shows here. So let's see. So we have uh, JP. Uh, okay. Uh, how about a plug-in for headphone jacks? So that is something that we actually did. We did talk with Jeff about, and he doesn't have any gear for that, but there is a headphone, uh, a headphone out that will be available for him as the host to start. And we will be adding a, dis a headphone distribution system there. Uh, the, the decision is going to be whether people will hear themselves or not, since everybody is in close proximity, or whether they will be sort of closed back and or open, open back, then they'll be able to hear each other talk. So there are a few decisions there, and that's something that, you know, when when Jeff figures out what would work best for him, we will be adding. But that is a very good point. In a studio, especially if you're doing things like with open mics like that, and especially, you know, high quality mics that are not really close mic like this, you would end up with a lot of feedback. So very good point. All of this stuff will need to be, uh, will need to have some sort of headphone distribution system. But that wasn't something that uh, Jeff had available at the time. So uh, it's a TBD, and we'll probably do, do an update on that. So let's see. Uh, so, so Ryan, of course, is uh, is sharing that uh, I don't have enough time uh, to go and rewire Steven's studio. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I I will actually say uh, time time is is not something that's been on my my side recently. So, uh, I will I will be happy to help uh, remotely. Uh, any way I can, uh, and and actually let me let me give a little a little side story for that uh, with helping remotely because it, it was pretty funny. Uh, I had Joe, who normally uh, does the TD for our shows. Joe came with me when we set up the studio, and I had Matt, who uh, does a lot of our, our software development uh, uh, from from our location here. Uh, he was remote because, you know, we clearly had to keep the business running and we have a, a lot of deliverables coming up. But when we needed to do certain things where Matt may have had some insight, what we actually did was we, like, propped up a piece of gear <laughs> and then used the PTZ camera to zoom in on that gear. And Matt would team viewer into one of the systems, open studio monitor, and control the PTZ camera <laughs> to go and look at what was going on in the gear, zoom into different things, and suggest things that we may want to do to do settings and other things. So it was just it was just a, a fun, interesting tidbit for how you could uh, how you could do something here with uh, you know remote support for people, even when you know it needs more more technical types of. Uh, uh, of input from them, especially like detail things for for settings and and things like that. So that may be something if you're ever in a bind and you have a PTZ camera, uh, just stick it in front of a piece of gear, let somebody team viewer in, studio monitor and control it. They can move around your studio and look at different settings and different things. So it can work pretty pretty well. So uh, so let's see. Uh, so, so Chris uh, just made a point. He says, everybody talks about the horrors of Dante on the same network as NDI. Uh, 
I agree that if this were a, a much larger setup, we definitely would have split this. Uh, but we, like I mentioned, we had two limitations. The first was that, uh, you know, we, we had gear that didn't accommodate uh, multiple NICs. Uh, and we also, you know, from a, from a sources point of view, we didn't have a lot of sources we were dealing with. So the way we handled this, I mean, just, uh, you know, to Chris's point, which is which is completely valid. I, I don't want to, I don't want to dismiss this. Is we we set up the Dante, and we looked at the latency and made sure that all looked good. We then introduced all of the NDI sources, and then tracked again with the latency on Dante to make sure that looked good. And then we did sound and video checks across on on all of them active, and everything looked good. Uh, while it is recommended that you know, from Ordinate, they would recommend doing it, it isn't, it isn't a hard requirement. And we do know people, even with much larger setups, that are running both of them on the same physical network. So it was something that we felt was worth the risk for the simplicity. Uh, we did lay out sort of the best practices. Uh, and, you know, that sort of stuff is, uh, you know, is certainly, certainly very doable in the future. So if we needed to add a second switch and we upgraded some of the gear so that it was dual nicked, uh, that would certainly be something we could do. And the other thing is with NDI 5, uh, you now have the ability to route NDI traffic to exclusively to specific NICs. So that would means that we could very easily keep that traffic off of uh, the Dante network. So it was something that we saw as working and a reasonable solution for the number of feeds we had, but also something that we weren't latched into, that if it turned out that this grew a bit and we needed to, to go a different direction, that was still an option for us and it wouldn't require extensive rewiring to do that. So thank you for that, because that, that I think is a, is, a, is a very good point. Uh, so let's see, uh, so JP was asking, can you talk about bringing in live callers? So there were, there were two systems that, that uh, are available for that in, in Jeff's studio. Uh, first, he has a phone system, which is basically, it's a cloud-based phone system. They give you a phone number and you run software locally that feeds audio out and takes audio back to return to them. So it's, it's a very simple system that basically has a queuing system. So you could have you know, one caller that's live and then other callers in the queue. Uh, we also have live to air. Let me see if I got a shot of that. So in live to air here, which is uh, just a, the other system for bringing in callers, there are two pieces to this. Uh, live to air has something called call-in manager. And what call and manager will do is something very similar to what you have in the phone system, but translated to the web. Somebody with a browser can connect to a URL that would be set up for a show. So here for us, we have uh, colon.studio slash streaming alchemy. So anybody that connects to that URL gets queued up to join us on the show and we'll, they'll show up in a queue of callers. Uh, from there, you can pick a caller an operator can connect to them, send them into live to air, and then that video and audio feed will go into the studio when they go on air. So it allows you to have the same type of screening and processing you'd have pre-going live, you know, for the call system. So, you know, the, the crazies and the, the others that uh, may, you know, want to call, or also people that could have technical issues. Uh, you, you, you have a step in between that people can deal with them. The other thing about the way we, we built live to air with Colon Manager is that Colon Manager is a cloud-based service that's run through a browser. So you could screen callers from a different location than your studio. So if Jeff wanted to have somebody in another location handle the incoming callers, help them get their devices set, and then feed them into the studio, he doesn't need another person in that small studio. That can all be handled remotely. So we, we tried to work around 
sort of the, the practical aspects of today's style productions and also the realities of you know, dealing with people who aren't necessarily experienced with technology using something for a call-in besides a phone. So, you know, in call-in, you have the ability to, to remotely change their cameras and their devices and their resolution. Uh, you can look at all the technical settings. So it gives you as a studio host a lot more control over video callers coming in. And it doesn't just have to be used for call-in. If you were onboarding, like in this case, we could do four guests here. If you were onboarding four people, you may want to have somebody have that type of, all four guests just come to one URL, we'll pull you each in, dial you in and send you into live here on the studio. So that's how we handle that type of thing with, uh, with call-in. So hopefully that covered what you were looking for. So let's see. Uh, Mady mentioned that open back headset, it will, g it will give you lots of headaches uh, of audio leak and it's a pain with those mics. Uh, yeah, I, I probably misspoke. I, I, I didn't, I wasn't thinking so much of open back. It was just my slip of speech. I was thinking of sort of the mono ear cup with, you know, a closed back ear cup uh, with, a, with, a, with a single mono so there was an open ear. So thank you for, for pointing that. You, you are correct. That's sort of, you would get, a, you would definitely get bleed from that. Uh, and you know, it, it's really a question of what what would work best. But yeah, in in a studio with live mics, uh, closed back would would definitely be the way to go for for headsets. So thank you for pointing that out, Mady. Uh, so Stephen says, is it hard to switch over to Dante? The thought of it kind of scares me. Uh, I think once you once you use Dante, uh, there's there's really no going back. I mean. We do everything with NDI and Dante here, and the flexibility, the simplicity, the ability to test things and just reroute them dynamically through uh, a screen on any computer, those types of things for both NDI and Dante really override, for in my mind, any of the hesitancy you may have. And the other thing is, now that you have mixers that take in Dante, you still get that physical control service. So it isn't just all sort of digital. You do have a, f a physical control device that lets you adjust sliders and you know, tweak you know, the, the signal path. So I, I don't know, like getting there, because we've done, been doing this for quite a while, so I, I, I can't speak with, use my comfort level as a, as a reference point here. But I do think that it is definitely worth moving in that direction. And it will make everything in your studio so much simpler. Uh, for every time I've you know, cursed at running bundles of XLR cables. Uh, back in a past life, I, I actually did a lot with uh, analog recording, analog recording studio. And I'm talking back in the 80s. So. Uh, uh, this is definitely something that I'm familiar with on the analog side and how frustrating that can be. Uh, having that single cable, you know, power, data, uh, audio, video is phenomenal. <laughs> I mean, that's, and it is definitely worth figuring out how to get to there and how to make it work in your environment and in your workflow, which I, I definitely understand. Both of those things are important, technically, how to implement it, but also from a workflow how to make it work for you. So let's see, for headphones, uh, Mady, uh, Mady's recommending the uh, Beyodynamic uh, DT770 Pros, uh, and it's 32 ohms, so that, that's good. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the Mackie HM400, I think, think we have a Mackie HM400 here. So yeah, the, love, the, love the Mackie gear uh, for, for these types of things. I'll have to take a look at the, uh, at the headphones. So th for thanks for suggesting that, because I'll, I'll pass that along to, to Jeff as well to see if uh, that's something he would be comfortable with. So thank you. Uh, so let's see. So yep, Stephen's <laughs> mentioning that he knows what his next investment uh, slash challenge will be. Yeah, uh, I think you once you make that switch, the, the investment in, in dollars, versus the investment in time. And so, you know, when you're working in this as a business, those two are fungible. Uh, I think you'll find that 
the, the time saving with, with setup, maintenance, uh, and flexibility for making changes dynamically will definitely be worth it in the long run for you. So uh, let's see. Okay, so we also have another question. Uh, Ryan was asking, how long was the project as a whole in labor hours? So uh, that, that's a good question. <laughs> it's, uh, we started probably at, I, I'm, I would guess, about 11 a.m. on Monday. And we would typically work from there through till about uh, 7, 7.30 at night. And we did that for five straight days. You know, there was obviously, you know, some breaks in there. So we probably had like eight hours of dead time in there where we, you know, either went out for lunch, got a coffee, did something like that. But uh, so in total, we are probably talking about 50 hours for everything. And that's from going to Lowe's and, and buying the wood, you know, to actually building the desk, to doing all the physical assembly, uh, and then the, the installation and configuration, you know, for everything that we were able to do, do there. So it was, vi I don't know, you know, at least for us, that was a very, very tight timeline to, to get all of that in. Uh, and, you know, there, if we were doing this sort of for ourselves, this would have probably been something that we would have done over a three week period where we would have set this up, you know, had, had all the build done, then, you know, sort of layered it in for time for the physical install and then time for the wiring and then time for configuration and setup and testing. So, you know, definitely, definitely was a tight timeline for us. Uh, probably if we did this as a business and, and, and had more experience, it, we could have done it far more efficiently. Uh, the other thing is we, we weren't sure before we got there exactly what equipment we'd be working with. We knew some of the pieces that were there uh, pre-existing, and there were other things that we didn't know anything about, like the capital IP. We, we, we knew that was the, the device, but we didn't really have any deep knowledge of it and had no time with it before. So there was a learning curve on some of the devices that we had to work with as well. So, you know, it's, uh, that was what it took us, but uh, definitely if, if you have feedback, we're, we're always interested in, in things we could have done better. So, you know, this show for us is as much about learning and sort of sharing as a community as it is about us talking about things that we already know about. So please, we're very open to, to any feedback you guys have that would be very helpful to us and probably a lot of other people as well. All right, so, uh, <laughs> so Stephen said, should have listened to me and booked the month. Yeah, well, uh, the, the point, I think the point, the more salient point is that uh, we don't do this as a living. So, uh, you know, that's, that's not the sort of thing we would normally uh, have time to, to carve out and do. So, you know, uh, Jeff is just a, a great guy. So we, we definitely want to do everything we could to, to help him and, and get things jump started for him to, to get back on air. And if you haven't listened, I mean, Jeff, Jeff has a natural talent for talking with people. Uh, he's done things where he's hosted uh, shows at NAB. Uh, and, you know, that's something which is uh, an art form, especially when you're dealing with lots of different guests coming in and talking about lots of different subjects. So certainly uh, certainly something that would be, uh, you know, we all could learn from because it, 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 it's, it's a, a native skill. So, you know, I'd love to see, see him get back on air and uh, start, to, uh, start to produce shows again out of his new studio. So we're looking forward to seeing that happen. So uh, if there are are any questions? Let's get them in, because uh, if not, we're we're gonna wrap this up. Uh, as I mentioned, this this was done over the course of a week. It was the reason we uh, we weren't able to do the show last Friday. Uh, part of the experience here, because we we knew we were gonna have to do construction, is we had to bring a lot of tools and other things with us. So we ended up making the decision to drive, 
Uh, that was probably not something I would do again <laughs> easily. Uh, you know, what Google Maps tells you, it's like 14 and a half hours of driving. Uh, not, not, not real world time. <laughs> I mean, I need more breaks than that. And, you know, I got to split the driving back there, you know, back and forth with Joe. But, you know, we were basically, you know, like two and a half days of driving each way uh, to cover this. So you, you, you start the week tired. Uh, and you come back even more tired. Uh, and the other point that I'd probably make is, uh, is uh, it's hot in Florida in July. <laughs> so, uh, w you know, you, you know it's hot, but see, when, you're, when you're in there and, you're, and the humidity is up and you have that sort of half rain every day, which is just, uh, so it's, uh, it's different weather than I'm used to here in New Jersey. And it, it can get hot in New Jersey here, but uh, that's, that's a, an altogether different weather experience. So... Uh, so, uh, Mady, just uh, thank you. Yes, he said it's, uh, he enjoys the live stream. It, I can tell you, missing last week's live stream, uh, it hurt. I, I, you know, you felt like you, you, know, you lost the connection with people. And so, uh, I thank all of, every one of you guys for, for showing up and, uh, you know, being part of this community. That's something that, uh, I look forward to every week, and uh, I'm very grateful that you make the time for it. So if that's everything then, thank you. We will be here next week, same time, same social channels. So until then, take care, be well.